funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television licence fee. During the first half of the 19th century, thousands of Irish convicts were transported to Australia for crimes ranging from stealing a sheep to murder. Now, why there's a dart of information on their personal stories and how they fared in Australia, nevertheless, in recent years, the story of County Sligo convict John Ty has emerged due to much hard work by many historians. To find out more, I met up with Dr. Fiona Gallagher, County Sligo historian and also author of several books, including The Streets of Sligo. We're here situated beside the old Sligo County Jail. The jail was built in around 1818 over a period of years and it's typical for a jail of its time. It's constructed to house people who had to serve either small sentences or were waiting transportation to Australia. So in the 1830s, a man called John Ty from the townland of Heapstown in County Sligo was incarcerated here until he was convicted of manslaughter and then transported to Australia. So the conviction had come about from a fight which Ty and his two friends were involved in and during which a man died from the injuries sustained. Since a man died, somebody had to take the fall and that man was John Ty. He was deported in October 1833 on a very long and arduous journey to the New South Wales colony aboard the Pamelia convict ship. He left his wife, Margaret, and two daughters behind in Ireland. You have to think about the poor woman that he left behind. That woman had a child four months old. How could she cope with that child? How was she going to manage? Hugh Kelly, local historian from Riverstown in County Sligo. How could he leave that child, even spending 15 months in Sligo jail and knowing what she was going through? No source of income. Women could not work. I have reports from 1830s that showed that they couldn't work. The flax industry was gone. When the flax was there, they could make a living. There was nothing for them to make a living on now. They may get, in the summer months, a few weeks' work at hay. But apart from that, there was no work for women. So women had no source of income. So like, it was difficult for her to exist and look after those two children in the middle of a time heading into the Great Famine. And while John Ty's wife Margaret was left to fend for herself and their two young daughters on her own, her husband eventually arrived into the Crown Colony of Australia in 1834. Fiona Gallagher. Within a short while he found himself working on a chain gang in the colony and after that he worked on a farm and then he became a freedman. He applied for his freedom after he had served a certain amount of time which was common in the judicial system at the time and he got that. Eventually he went into farming himself in New South Wales, worked like a tiger, prospered and became a wealthy farmer and landowner. He became a local politician in New South Wales and a noted philanthropist. Um, but for many people, he's known as the convict with a heart. And this is because for over a quarter of a century, he tried many times to get his wife, Margaret, and his two daughters to Australia. He tries in 41, they don't come. We don't know why. He tries, obviously, in 48, 49, in, under the new scheme, they don't come. He tries again with the remittance regulations about 1851, they don't come. Dr. Richard Reid, historian from Canberra in Australia and also author of the book Farewell My Children, Irish Assisted Emigration to Australia, 1848-1870. Here's Hugh Kelly. 24 years struggle to get her out to Australia, like, you know, the letters that were in vain, the letters that got there and she was unable to travel because of fever that prevented her. When you had fever, you would not be allowed on a boat, even though her passage was there, paid for and all. She couldn't take advantage of it because of the fever. It was very, very tough on him. He had a dream waiting by the tide to see his wife once more at his side a world away far far apart John Ty the convict with a tender heart and a 
as prior contributors just mentioned. John Ty tried many times to get his wife and two daughters out to Australia. Eventually, nearly a quarter of a century after he left Ireland in 1833, he succeeded in that task and was reunited with them in Sydney in the year 1858. This is John Ty's story, the story of the Irish convict with a big heart, who made good for himself and his family in Australia. This is a story of devotion. It's a story of fidelity, which was not something too easy to maintain across the huge distances in an era before telegraph and when letters took a long while to arrive. It's a story of fidelity and it's a story of, I suppose, never giving up. What strikes me about it, I suppose, it's a love story that he was determined to get his wife and his family and to be reunited with them. For the times, you, you would have to really admire that. It really is a story of love, like you know it is, and hardship. There is an awful lot of hardship in it. Like. Apart from that, I think John Ty symbolises the grit and the determination and the sheer steadfastness which made so many Irish succeed down under and help build the modern society that is Australia today. And before delving further into John Ty's story and his roots, first it's worth noting that some people pronounce his surname Ty and others Tyg. Now we'll use the pronunciation Ty in this documentary, in line with the majority of contributors. Here's John McTiernan, former County Sligo librarian, to explain John Ty's Heapstown County Sligo roots. Now Heapstown... It takes its name from a 30-foot high cairn of stones, which is said to date from the 4th century, and marks the burial place of a local chieftain whose name has not survived. John Ty was born in 1797 in a humble cottage in close proximity to the mound. As a young man, he found employment as a labourer of the Heapstone estate, and in 1827 he married Mary McDonough, a local girl, by whom he had two daughters named Honora and Mary. Here we are, three miles outside Riverstown, in a, the townland of Heapstown. But over there, just behind that, is where there was a cluster. Just a short distance from a the short, Neolithic Cairn that John Ty would yards, have been looking about on. About 100 yards was, from, yeah. from the Neolithic Cairn. And there's a row of cabins there. And it, it could be from those cabins that John came from. Now, we, we cannot say for sure it's a long time ago, when you're talking about nearly 200 years ago. And they have disappeared, but there would be tracks in the ground of where they once stood. Historian Hugh Kelly. They are very, very interesting from the point of view like that he would have worked on the estate, John did, and he also would have worked for William Weir across here as well. And the family all worked for Weir as well as working for McTiernan. So the important thing about it was that if he was a labourer there, he would have to give so many hours per week to the landlord, and the rest then he would have an acre or two to work on for himself. And it was divided, he either gave the first three days or the last three days to the landlord. So that, that was how it was done in those days. However, things weren't easy for John Ty and his family living in Heapstown during this period, with poverty and hunger endemic. In the 1700s and the early 1800s, there was always small famines. We had the great famine that everyone talks about. But even right through the 1800s, there was a particularly bad one here in 1879 even. There was famines all the time. But the big one has drowned out all the other ones. But they were equally as important in their own way because we'll say there was the hungry months of June, July and that when they were running out of food before the new harvest came along. There were terrible times for them like if they had their food all eaten, like, you know, survival was what it was all about. However, the young John Ty was fortunate in that he learned to read and write from an early age. Education, I would say myself, hedge school was the only one. Hedge school masters on the move. Even some of them could uh, teach Latin or anything like that. But if John could read and write, he had to come in contact with them. Or else they came into contact with Mr Weir or 
McTiernan or someone that got a teacher that was able to teach them. They definitely didn't uh, pick it up off any of their own colleagues because the vast majority of people couldn't read or write. Even two generations later, they couldn't read and write. Illiteracy was the order of the day. Order of the day is right. Unfortunately, in the year 1831, Tiny's two friends got into a fight with a local man named McDermott. As a result, McDermott died from injuries sustained. Richard Reed. They bop this guy on the head called McDermott. McDermott takes a little while, sadly, for him to die. They get arrested and charged with manslaughter, basically. In early 1834, March 1834, the three of them get tried for manslaughter. They're convicted of this. The judge looks at them and said, this is a very sad case. These are three respectable young men, but the law is the law, and I'm going to send you over the seas for seven years. So they're transported to New South Wales. There's huge numbers transported in the 1830s. A lot of it is what's sort of euphemistically called for agrarian unrest. Dr Perry McIntyre of the Global Irish Studies Centre at the University of New South Wales. So how perhaps did the fight which eventually led to John Ty's transportation come about? This could well have been an affray of some sort or a feud, uh, but we don't really know. There's indications that it might be, but we don't really... Was there any political tinge? Just no, no evidential trail? Well, or evidence? it was only... The, the guy they whacked over the head with a stick was hardly at a, an age or stage. We don't know. The three of them could have well been walking home from the pub in their cups or something, and this kid could have said something to them. But that's just an assumption. We have no idea, really. Here we are at Heapstown Crossroads. It's very difficult for us to know at this point what actually caused the frack. It's very, very difficult for us to know. But uh, there was always fracas going on up at, we say, Castle Baldwin, when there'd be fairs on it back into the, that particular century. And it was often talked about, and it even came into the 20th century. There was fracas that went on. I think Gaelic football probably took a lot of it out of it. It was young men fighting, you know. Uh, so that their energy has gone elsewhere. But it's difficult for us to say why young MacAndrew, Tig, and Condon got involved with this young, what to describe in the court case as a boy, McDermott. He was very young, obviously. And the blow to the head, you see, that's why it ended up as a manslaughter. Hugh Kelly. And whatever the reason for the fight, because McDermott died... John Ty and his co-accused were incarcerated in Sligo Jail. So what were conditions like there? Tamla McHugh, archaeologist and also a member of the community group, the Friends of Sligo Jail. When John Ty was here in the 1830s, conditions were very good. We actually have inspectors' reports that were done each year. And in 1831, the prison... They basically said that it was one of the better ones in Ireland. Um, Now, it was very well run. And also, in terms of the sanitary conditions here, they were very good. Um, We had a building known as the Treadmill. And um, within this building was a very large wooden wheel. And that was operated by the prisoners. So this was part of their daily routine. Each prisoner had to do 14,000 steps on the treadmill. So they basically walked around it and it acted as a pump and it brought fresh water up from the Garvogue River, which is nearby. And that would have flushed out the drains and kept the present clean and fresh water for everybody. And as Tamla McHugh just mentioned, while the prison regime in Sligo Jail was quite good for the time, nevertheless, John Ty lacked the one thing which most people yearn for most, their freedom. I can imagine, you know, losing your freedom like that must have been quite a reality check for him. And certainly the regime and, and, and how strict it was. Um, you didn't step out of line here. You were um, punished severely for it. But, I mean, if you told the line, if you did your work, and, you know, you would, you could end up back out again better than you were, you know, with a certain amount of education, good health. All the prisoners were well taken care of, you know, as much as they could. The story of Ty and his two companions, Conlon and MacAndrew, in the jail is an interesting one. Uh, There is a petition 
to the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in 1832 from the three of them asking to be brought to trial. Because they're, they're, they're sort of saying, look, we've been in here for then it's 12 months, 50, whatever it is, the period of time. I'd have to have the document in front of me to be precise about that. But they're virtually accusing the Crown of, of shilly-shallying and, you know, they can't find proper witnesses. And They, they said that the uh, Crown is trying to assemble witnesses, that certain witnesses have backed off. You know, we demand to be brought to trial for this instead we're incarcerated here. And the response comes back from the Lord Lieutenant that the, the judge in the assizes have made decisions and, that, and you know, I can't, and the Lord Lieutenant cannot interfere. Actually, they hadn't been in court. This is not the case. What was written on the uh, petition by the Lord Lieutenant Secretary was actually not applicable to them. They had not yet been brought to trial and a judge had not yet said anything about this. They were still waiting in Sligo jail for a trial. But the trial eventually comes. Historian Richard Reid. Here is John McTiernan. The Sligo Journal newspaper, which was a weekly publication and which carried an account of Ty's trial at the spring assizes in Sligo in March 1833, when he and two others were indicted on causing the death of a young boy from head injuries received in a beating. The circumstances of which were not disclosed at the court hearing and who had died in Sligo County Infirmary a month later in December 1832 from the injuries he had received. In the evidence before them, the jury found the defendants guilty of manslaughter and Judge Burton, who presided, sentenced both John Ty and one James McAndrew to transportation for seven years and the other co-accused named Conan also eventually ended up getting seven years' transportation to Australia. However, the sentence could have been much worse. Perry McIntyre. That's the interesting thing about Ty and his two compatriots, is that they were eventually convicted of manslaughter. But the judge virtually says this is a sad case. Um, you know, these guys actually aren't bad. So they get seven years for manslaughter. Well, really, they probably should have had 14 or, or life for a manslaughter sentence. At the time, transportation was seen as less harsh to death, but it was also a sort of late Georgian, early Victorian idea of if the accused was sent abroad, he had a chance to redeem himself morally uh, by working, as God intended to him, working the soil and working the land in another country. So he should be grateful for having his life spared. So none of this would have gone through his mind. All that would have been concerning him was what was going to happen to Margaret and his girls. Fiona Gallagher. John Ty, the convict, set sail from Ireland for Australia in October 1833. So just how did the voyage go? Perry McIntyre. It was a pretty standard voyage. They didn't stop anywhere. They sailed out of Cork. All the convict ships sailed out of Cork, the Cove Harbour. So the, his first journey would have been to get from Sligo, jail, down to Cork. And they often took them in carts, in, in little groups. So John and the two men that he committed this crime with, and I can't remember now exactly, there might have been a couple of other Sligo convicts on that ship, but they would have gone down in a cart. And then they were held in the local prison until such time as the ship was ready for them to board. And then they sailed all the way down across the trade winds uh, around the bottom of Africa and straight across around the bottom of Tasmania and up the east coast of Australia to Sydney. That was the standard route. And they're usually something like 160 to 190 days was the voyage. And standard, there was a surgeon on board, so they were looked after, were there any illnesses or not? And I don't think there were any deaths on that ship. Very few died on the ships. There were the odd, terrible voyages where people died, but in general, they were pretty, pretty safe voyages. The thing that one has to realise about convict voyages... The 1830s is the biggest single decade for the numbers of convicts being transported from England, Ireland, Scotland, a few of them, to, to New South Wales. Well, you need to remember that the colonial authorities wanted them to arrive in good health. 
This is not meant to be a voyage where they are, you know, badly looked after, where they're kept in chains below deck, where there's... They're not like slave voyages, if you want to look at that, you know, uh, in, in Americanism. Nothing a bit like that. By the 1830s, they want these to be smooth, uh, and they want them to arrive in good health. So there's a naval surgeon, he's a royal naval surgeon, on, on the ship, and it's his job to make sure the diet is, is adequate. Richard Reed. Here's Andrew Cairns, County Sligo local historian and also editor of the book Church of the Sacred Heart, Riverstown, the story of a church and its people. The journeys to Australia were the, very much the whole purpose of getting people from Ireland out to Australia. These people were convicts, they were expected to do work when they got out there. There was They were seen as a, a valuable commodity for want of a better word. So there was an, an economic imperative in getting them to Australia in one piece and healthy so the conditions on board the ships to Australia would have been much better and it struck me that they all had medical officers who were responsible for the welfare of the convicts or the passengers and to make sure that they arrived healthy in Australia. And after a long journey, Ty eventually arrived into Sydney in March 1834. So just how did things go for him? Perry McIntyre. The convict ship has got that he's assigned as a servant to go and work for a uh, Mr Dwyer. It's actually D-Y-E-R on the shipping list, but we later discover uh, that it's Dwyer. And we're not sure. It's, it's in Sydney. We're not quite sure what he did, but probably just a general labourer because he didn't seem to have a specific occupation. However, relations between John Toy and his new employers were less than congenial. Within only a few months, he was taking them to court for harassment over an incident where he refused to light a fire. Richard Reed. He takes Mrs Dwyer to court. He accuses her of having assaulted him, virtually, to the magistrates. And the magistrates think this is ridiculous. Mrs. Dwyer is an elderly woman. She's no way she could possibly hurt you, John. You know, uh, John Dye. You're far too big and strong, and everything else. You know, so this is a frivolous, uh, a frivolous complaint. But it talks in this little there's a, account of this court case, and it talks of how he had refused to set the fire. You know, that Mr. Dwyer is giving evidence on his wife's behalf and said, "Well, this rogue, you know, wouldn't didn't do what he was told. I told him to set the fire, and he wouldn't do it, etc." And at the end of this court case, uh, Ty says, I want protection from these people. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's hilarious. You don't know what's going on there. And this is within, as I say, a couple of months of him arriving and being assigned. And while we don't know the reason why Ty refused to light that fire for the Dwyers, the upshot was that a short while later he ended up working on a road chain gang, also known as an iron gang. He was sent to an iron gang for aggressive behaviour. So he wasn't, wasn't in chains when he came out on the ship, but he was sent to an iron gang, which is where a work gang are out making roads and they're there with their picks and shoals and they are chained to each other the full time. And it's probably one of the worst punishments that any of the convicts had. It was really rough, tough work. A chain gang for a year. He got the chain gang for refusing maybe to light a fire. Something as simple as that. And Dwyer was the name of the person that was he was with at the time. And a strong chance that that Dwyer was an Irishman for that matter. But some stupid little thing he, he decided was too menial for him to do, from what I can gather. And he gets a year. Hugh Kelly. So just how tough would life have been for John Ty working in an iron gang? Richard Reed. Very nasty if you're up in the you know the back roads of the bush in, in, in New South Wales and you're making a new road into the bush where you've got to cut down trees, you've got to, you know, with your pick, you've got to pick pick away at the stones. It's, I mean, it's back-breaking, you know, and, and in the heat and so on in summer in New South Wales, not pleasant work. And at night you're, you're put in little kind of portable cabins that are you know, almost stand-up kind of things uh, to be guarded. So, no, being in an, in an iron gang was regarded certainly as one of the worst forms of punishment.
After John Toy completed his year in the Iron Gang, he was next assigned by the authorities to work on the Bury Farm Estate in Coolangatta, situated just south of Sydney. Now it was while working there that he eventually became a free man once more in 1841. Perry McIntyre. It seems that once he'd done his 12 months in the chain gang, that he was then assigned to Alexander Berry. And it's while he's on that property that he gets his certificate of freedom and then proceeds as a free man to purchase land and become a, a free settler in the colony. And while John Ty now had his freedom, what he didn't have were his beloved wife and daughters, who were still back in Ireland. He now sought to rectify this. He obviously had huge affection for his family and his wife for him too, I, I, probably, or she would have told him not to bother or something. And there are incidences when these men apply for their wives and families left behind where we've got records where the wife refuses to come for various reasons and sometimes even remarries, even though, you know, it's probably a bigamous marriage. But that aside, he applies formally under a scheme called the Wives and Families of Convict Scheme, which is devised for men who were by then freed at, at the ticket of leave stage and considered respectable and able to support the family should they arrive in the colony. They were given a free passage and they're one of the few groups that ever were given a totally free passage um, to New South Wales. So he applies for his wife and children on a form and that's where we know a bit more about her because it gives her maiden name and where she's living at the time and the ages of the children. And also on the back of this petition is where the, there was the annotation that he had, he had gone to a chain gang for 12 months because they investigate them. But he's now free and it was allowed. But uh, she doesn't come at that stage. And while a golden opportunity was lost... Nevertheless, Ty decided to persist in his quest to be reunited with his family in Australia. So what did he do next? Richard Reed. We're not absolutely sure what he does then, because we, we lose sight of him in the documents. Right? This is when it gets really interesting, because the next document we pick up about John Ty is a letter that is written by the police magistrate in a place called Wollongong, which is not far from where Coolangatta is. It's, a, it's about 50 kilometres or so north of where he had been assigned to, to the Berry estate. So this letter comes from the police magistrate. He's a guy called Plunkett. He's from Roscommon. He is writing to a friend of his up in Sydney called Merriweather, who is the immigration agent in Francis New South Wales. Francis Merriweather, indeed. Francis Merriweather, the immigration agent in New South Wales. So Plunkett sends this letter to his, his a friend, Mary, the, the, the colonial official, so he knows who, who Merriweather is. And he simply says, look, I've been approached uh, in Wollongong here by a local man called John Ty. John Ty has been a prisoner of the Crown. So that's, we know he's, suddenly we know he's a convict. If all you knew was this letter, you'd know Ty was a convict. He was assigned to Mr. Berry, who gives him a good name. He says he's, you know, a bit a respectable guy. He wants to bring his wife and family out from Ireland. And, you know, I'm asking, is there anything you can do for him? I attach a letter to my letter that has come to him, telling him of the, about his wife and family back in Ireland. So that letter is attached to Plunkett's letter to Merriweather. And it's that letter that's really significant. And the letter in question which Richard Reed has just been talking about would have been penned in County Sligo and then posted to John Ty in Australia, who received it in late 1849. It's four pages long. It's all handwritten. It's written by a guy called Edward Feeney, who is the parish priest of Riverstown in Sligo in 1848. The basic situation is he's writing to Ty to tell him about his family and about what has happened to his family during the famine. Now, we're at 1848. We're at the fourth year of the famine. Uh, and he is writing to tell his Ty that, look, I want to let you know that your wife and your family, they have been obliged. Mr. McTurnan, the landlord of Heapstown, where they're living, has obliged all the small cottiers to leave his land. They've been evicted from their home. 
Uh, I'll tell you about your daughter, Honora. You know, she's married to a guy called John McDonough, who is an industrious young man and should do well for himself. Uh, your other daughter, Mary, is living with her mother, with her uncle in Anakati, which is a nearby town, town land. They've gone to live there after they've been evicted. He then goes on to say, I well remember the time that Mrs. Chisholm's letters came here to bring the family to Australia. Now, Carolyn Chisholm is a very famous lady in Australian migration history. In, in the uh, 1840s, she set up a female immigrant depot in Sydney to look after young women who were out of employment or she was trying to get into employment and she'd take them down the country to find them good employers and all this kind of thing when the government is not looking after them in, in, in that particular way. So she's one of the heroines, if you, if, if you like looking after these women. And Carolyn Chisholm came back to England from Australia in 1847. And she came back with a list of convict families, men who had committed crimes in England and Ireland, and they'd approached her in New South Wales saying, we'd like to get our families out because transportation stopped in 1840 and they used to bring them out on female convict ships. But that stopped. We'd like to get them out. So she approaches the English uh, colonial secretary, Earl Grey, and she puts the, the, the point to him, this is, this is not a very morally good thing to have happened, that these men are separated from their families, they're now living good lives in New South Wales, I've met some of them, you know, she makes a whole case to him. Uh, he ultimately agrees they should reinstitute the reunion of wives and families and do something and the British government should pay for it. And ultimately that, that's what happened. But on her list she has Margaret Ty of Heapstown in uh, Sligo. And anyway... He says, I remember Mrs. Chisholm sending letters to here to your wife to tell your wife and, the, and her, her daughters to go to Dublin to take shipping in the Waverley, which is a ship that she's organised to take some of these wives and families out to Tasmania. Not to New South Wales, because Tasmania is still a convict place, and so they can, you know, they can go on a, on a convict voyage, because the Waverley is actually a convict ship about to go off to Tasmania, and then they, they will find ways to get them up to Sydney. But your wife and her, her two were lying in the fever at the time. Another letter then came later on, and they still couldn't go, and then I have had no more letters from Mrs Chisholm since that time. I think we have to remember, we have to put this into its, its historical context as well, communication was extremely difficult. Margaret herself was illiterate, Father Feeney and, and the parish priest in Sydney, they were the people who corresponded, and it took months for a letter to get to him from Australia. Historian Fiona Gallagher. It also took weeks for a letter to even get to London or Dublin to arrange this sort of transport. So we may look at the story and say, oh, but how did they miss the ship? Of course they missed the ship. How, how could they walk? to Sligo, you know, a distance of possibly 13, 15 miles when they simply couldn't stand up. So this is the context we have to look at. So there's lack of communication and there's sheer sickness, sheer illness and sickness that they were lucky to escape death from. Also in his letter to John Ty, Father Feeney discussed a famine then engulfing Ireland. Richard Reid. He says, while I'm writing this letter to you, your wife is standing by my side. I know who she is. I summoned her. She came in. She's very destitute of help. Any money you could send would be very appreciated, etc. She's never forgotten you. She sends her love to you, etc., etc. This is a terrible time here in this parish. The potato crop has failed again all over Ireland. In a, what's your letter? 1848. And we are facing similar things. You've probably... He actually says something to the effect you've probably read of what is happening here in Ireland. The crop has failed again and we face you know, another terrible, terrible year. When the Great Irish Famine began in 1845, John Ty's wife Margaret and daughters lived in the parish of Riverstown in County Sligo. So just how much was Riverstown affected by the Great Famine? Riverstown historian Hugh Kelly. One day in January of 1847, the coroner, Dr. Burroughs, was sent for. Head Constable Hay in Riverstown sent for him. And he wrote in his letter to him that he had 15 bodies in for him to examine. Now, he did examine them and the reports say that they died from starvation, lack of food, whatever. And on examination, it was found that there was no food in their intestines or their stomachs. So like the, it was starvation that they died from, total starvation. And what was even worse, there were six more buried without an inquest. 
they were buried straight from where they died. So in other words, maybe so famine, fever, typhus, whatever. Just to give you an idea, for typhus, yeah. And that's just to give you an idea of one week in January. The particular area that Margaret and her daughters were in was heavily affected by famine. Fiona Galler. In fact, the electoral division, which is Lakeview, had up to 45% decline in population between 1841 and 1851, and it, most of them were famine-related deaths. So. Which is way above the average. Uh, it is. Clago Little Mio, North of Common, had possibly the highest excess death rate in all of the famine, in excess of 60%, which is enormous. And while Margaret and her family escaped death from hunger and disease... As was briefly touched on already, unfortunately they didn't escape eviction by their Heapstown landlord, James McTiernan. Former County Sligo librarian, John McTiernan. It's difficult to know why he was clearing them. Uh, now, when that letter was being written by the parish priest of Riverstone, he already had cleared the ties from their old cottage. And they had to go and find a residence with their relatives. In Anacarty. In Anacarty and uh, the neighbouring town land. It wasn't that he had any vindictiveness against the ties. He seems to have uh, moved whoever else was in those humble cottages on his estate across the road from the Heapstone Mound. However, one factor which likely contributed to James McTiernan evicting the ties from his estate was the new £4 clause imposed on Irish landlords by the British government from 1847 onwards. Historian Bernard O'Hara of the Galway Archaeological and Historical Society. When the weak government under Lord John Russell came to power in June 1846, they were determined to follow the prevailing policy of laissez-faire and they were also determined to make sure that Irish poverty was paid for by Irish property. In 1847 they introduced the Poor Law Extension Act and one of the provisions of that act was the four pound clause and this was that if where a person had a holding valued at four pound or less the landlord had to pay the poor law rates and not the tenant. Consequently, the landlords did not like that, and any opportunity they got to evict their tenants, they did so. Um, now, admittedly, there were some good landlords who didn't do that, but most of them used this opportunity to try to get the tenants off their holdings. And um, that certainly aggravated the terrible situation that was there at the time. All the landlords at that time were anxious to clear their estates, and they were beginning to build stately homes and that on them. Rockbrook down just below Riverstown was cleared around the same time. Historian Hugh Kelly. Now the only ones that I haven't any reference of that happening to was the Cooper estate out there. There was notice of eviction issued but I have no reference anywhere as to where people were evicted off it. They were never enacted upon. But uh, here it was a very harsh thing to do. At The timing was wrong. It was a very harsh thing to put a widow woman out but lucky enough, she had her brother's place to go to back in Anacarty. And knowing that his beloved Margaret and his daughters were stuck in famine-ravaged Ireland, and that life couldn't have been easy for them, John Ty persisted in his attempts to try and get them out to Australia, this time applying to the authorities for passage for them in and around 1851. Richard Reed. He then tries to bring the family out under a scheme known as the Remittance Regulations in, in New South Wales. That's where he goes along to the Karka Petty Sessions in, in Wollongong, it would be, and he puts money down and says, right, I want to bring Margaret Ty and Honora McDonough and you know, Mary Ty out to New South Wales, and I'll pay a portion of the fare, and the government will pay the rest. They'll be assisted emigrants coming out. And nothing happens. You know, they don't arrive. They don't, they don't arrive. And so we don't know anything much at that point about what has happened, except there's a letter comes back from the immigration authorities in London saying that family's gone to America. So that's all you have, gone to America. Historical archives record that by the early 1850s, Margaret Ty and her daughters were resident in Taunton, Massachusetts. So what perhaps might conditions have been like for them and other famine Irish there? Here is Professor Catherine Shannon of Westfield State University in Massachusetts to discuss the nearby Boston experience. 
Living conditions were absolutely awful. Very, very crowded conditions down in the waterfront area, people living in cellars. Not unlike the situation that uh, faced the people who were stuck in Liverpool in the famine years and immediately afterwards. Oscar Hanlon, the Harvard historian, was one of the first people to expose these terrible, terrible conditions. And he has a quote from one of the Yankees who was writing about the Irish at the time. And the quote was that he never saw a gray-haired Irishman in Boston. And I think that the average time in which a male immigrant survived in Boston after arrival was somewhere between 10 and 14 years. And then, you know, they were gone after that because, of course, their jobs were, if they had jobs, were backbreaking jobs, jobs that created great risk of injury and so forth. So it was a terrible life. And certainly for the women, it would have been equally awful. And it's worth pointing out that by this stage, as John Ty's family eked out a living in Massachusetts, he himself had made no less than four attempts to try be reunited with them. Richard Reed. He tries in 41, they don't come. We don't know why. He tries, obviously, in uh, 48, 49, you know, under the new scheme, they don't come. He tries again with the remittance regulations, but 1851, they don't come. So what's going on here, you know, what's happened? And the next thing that we sort of discern about him is actually as a result of an amazing digitization of Australian newspapers called Trove. Uh, this is a big project undertaken by the National Library in Canberra in Australia to digitize every well, that's the end game, every Australian newspaper. So as you can get online and you can search. Now, 20 years ago, you know, you'd have been wading through big pages and, you know, you might find something, you might not find it because you're dealing with the original hard copy or microfilm, which is even worse. Very hit and miss. Well, for hit and miss, microfilm is, again, it's an awful thing to be using, burning your eyes out in front of a screen, going through every wretched issue of of of, of a newspaper. But now you can simply do something like, say, John Ty, Wollongong. And you can put the dates. Uh, I want to know any reference to John Tai Wollongong between 1850 and 1860. And up will come any reference to John Tai. And lo and behold, there's a lot of references on Trove to John Tai, this guy. So we have a lot of work to do to untangle all the references. But one that came up for 1856, so this is five years later after the attempts to get the wife and family out, is he's selling a farm in Charcoal Creek in Wollongong. Now the on this sale, it lists all the animals, the, the amount of freehold land he's got, the amount of land he's leasing. You know, it's, it's an inventory of everything that's on this farm. And when you look at it and you re- realize that this is quite a big enterprise, this is not some little tiny one acre plot, you know, back in Sligo. This is a significant farm that he holds here. And it's going to be sold by auction, etc., etc. It gives the date when that's going to happen. And then it says at the very bottom of this, it says because it has to be sold quickly because Mr. Tai wants to join his family in America. Now, that is just amazing. You know, I mean, this, it's clear that they're in contact. He must know where they are by that point, otherwise he wouldn't be selling up and proposing to actually go and join them there. Now, we know he never does this because he's buried in the cemetery in Wollongong. doesn't happen. What does happen is that Margaret and her daughters decided instead to travel to Australia. Now, given the fact that by then John Ty was a very prosperous farmer, it's likely that he paid their passage out. Also, historian Andrew Cairns had this pertinent comment to make. The fact that he was apparently intending to sell everything in Australia and perhaps move to America to make a new life for his wife and family underlines my theory about this being a love story that he was prepared to give all of that up and sell and move to America to be with them again would be an indication of that or would underline this being a love story more so than anything else of course we know subsequently that the wife and family moved to Australia and they were reunited And there on a ship in 1858, called the Carrington, direct from New York to Sydney, was Margaret Tye, 
you know, Honora McDonough, Mary McDonough, Michael McDonough, and two grandchildren. So that's 1858. Now, if you want to think of an image that sort of, you know, what must it have been like, I often wonder, was he standing at the quayside, you know, on that day when this ship sails down Sydney Harbour, you know, to tie up, and there it is, 1834, he hasn't seen them since then, and here he is standing on the dock in 1858, and they're all trooping off the ship, including his grandchildren that, that obviously he's never seen. So that would be an amazing moment, think of that. But there they are, they're reunited. Now, we don't know how, you know, but did he send them the money? Is that possible? Richard Reed. Here's Perry McIntyre. His daughters were only small children when he was transported. You know, if you can just imagine what it was like to see a spouse you hadn't seen after 24 years, you might not even recognise them. <laughs> The one thing I will say is, when he left Ireland, he had left a wife with two young children, one of them only four months old, when you think about it that way. And here he was, 24 years later, on the quay in Sydney, waiting for this boat to come in. And what was coming in, he left what you might call his girlfriend behind him in Ireland. I know she was his wife. She was a young woman. He was waiting for a granny. Historian Hugh Kelly. When you think about it that way, he was waiting for a granny to arrive with her grandchildren and the 24-year gap. Like He was waiting for that and his in-laws. Now, the man, according to all the research that has been done, kept faithful to that woman for the full 24 years and her to him. On all the research that's done, he could never be found out of place. So, like, he was a good straight man. He might have had his faults, he might fight and everything else, but he, he certainly stood by her. He was brilliant. So you can imagine what was going through his mind. What occurs now, of course, is really a story of settlement. You know, what happens to the family in uh, Wollongong and so on, and we have a lot of material on that. Historian Richard Reed. Land records, it shows exactly where he bought new land. After he, It seems he probably did sell this farm, we, we found in 56 at some point. And with the money from that, he bought some more land, a uh, place near Mount Kembla in uh, Fig Tree in Wollongong. And they settled there. Um, he becomes a councillor of the West Wollongong Council. He appears in the paper numerous times, attending council meetings. And, you know, we've got the to and fro on, on that. So clearly he's a respectable man in the neighbourhood. We find him, interestingly, if you're thinking about sort of ethnic solidarity when you've gone overseas, we find him contributing to Irish causes of, of one sort or another. Uh, Charles Gavin Duffy emigrated to Australia in 1855, and uh, in order for Gavin Duffy to get into Parliament in Victoria, there was a, a subscription for allow to, to, because you had to have a certain amount of money and property, so there's a subscription to get Gavin Duffy, and he's on that, John Ty giving money. He also gave money during the famine. There was a collection in uh, Wollongong. Oh yeah, there's, there's, there's a whole lot of, uh, there's not I say a lot, there's, but there's lists of people giving money during the famine to, back to Ireland, uh, collected in, in New South Wales, in Port Phillip as it was, and in Brisbane and so on. So uh, John Ty appears in that giving a pound, I think, it, think it was about 1846 or 47, I can't remember the exact date, but he's certainly on there. He gives money to a thing called the Donegal Relief Committee, which is to help people in Donegal be brought out as emigrants in 1858. 59. He contributes to the local convent. There's a convent built in, in the early 1870s by the Good Samaritan Sisters, who are a, a Australian order, not an Irish order coming out to Australia. And he gives six pounds to them, and then he gives them a hundred pounds to help build the convent. And a hundred pounds, when he did that, would have been big money. You know, so Ty has obviously done well. Apart from the convent, which had a school associated with it, he's obviously interested in education because in 1861 there was a Catholic college built at the University of Sydney, St John's College, and he donated money towards the building of that as well. So he's quite philanthropic once he's settled and has money. Perry McIntyre. Here's Daniel Cusick, Irish-Australian historian and also author of the book The Great Famine in County Meath. Most convicts, when all said and done, once they were in Australia, they're able to quickly 
pull themselves up by their boots, so to speak, get on the ladder of economic security, get married, have a family, get land and all the rest of it. And actually some of them came so-called respectable and um, quite well-off citizens. And, and John Tyre was in that category. So he wasn't alone in that. It was, in some ways it wasn't an atypical convict in Australia's story. In that sense, at least, a lot of them did well for themselves. Here's this guy who's obviously destitute in 1834 as a convict, and by 1870s, he's well off. The Thai has obviously done well. Having become a free man, he was able to look after himself and buy land and progressed very well and even got elected to the local council. He succeeds. He came up the hard way. He didn't become mean or tight or anything like that. The generosity went with it, and there's an awful lot to be said for that. He dies in 1886, the wife dies in 1885, they're buried side by side in the, in the Catholic section of the Wollongong Municipal Cemetery with natives of County Sligo right, written on the grave. songs and guitar music in this documentary are by singer-songwriter Cliff Wedgbury. Over the last while we've uncovered the remarkable story of the County Sligo convict John Ty, who, against all the odds, made good for himself and his family in Australia. John Ty was a man who arrived into Australia as a convict, ended up working on a chain gang, yet within two decades had succeeded beyond most emigrants' wildest dreams progressing to being a large, prosperous farmer, a respected local politician and a noted philanthropist. As touched on by historian Richard Reid just a short while ago, the fact that he was donating £100 to a convent in the 1870s is ample proof that he succeeded financially. However, undoubtedly his biggest success was being reunited with his beloved wife Margaret and his family after nearly a quarter century separation from them. So what big lessons, if any, do we have to learn from John Ty's remarkable life story? Historian Andrew Cairns. For me, the salutary lesson from all of this is a story of love and of family and the power of kinship and uh, the power of love. They remain true to each other over the years, so many thousand miles apart. That was what appealed to me about the whole thing. John McTiernan. Here's Fiona Gallagher. It's a story of love, it's a story of fidelity, and it's a story symbolising the grit and determination which made so many Irish succeed down under and build a modern Australian state. He had a dream Waiting by the tide To see his wife once more at his side A world away Far, far apart John Ty the convict With a tender heart A Sligo man On a convict ship To leave his kin In famine's grip Breaking rocks in the burning sun The chain gang beckoned and the chain gang won To break his back and bring him pain But he resolved to see his wife again A Sligo man on a convict ship to leave his kin in famine's grip transportation 
for seven years from a Sligo jail to New South Wales leaving Margaret whom he loved so dear with two small girls and hardships fear a Sligo man on a convict ship to leave his kin in famine's grip they were evicted and the famine came to lay them low with fever's pain ships forsaken and voyages missed bad luck was theirs in fate's cruel twist waiting for another ship to break away from famine's grip after seven years John Ty was freed as a farming man he would succeed but with his wealth and craving wish to see his family he would persist a farming man with an aching heart for a family growing and far apart the long years passed his daughters wed to Massachusetts the family fled so he tried in vain to sell his land and join them in that promised land a farming man with an aching heart a family growing far far apart but from New York they all set sail to join John Ty in New South Wales his dream fulfilled to a happy fate reunited 1858 setting sail on the Carrington to Sydney Harbour the dream had come funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with the television license fee.